Hi. Yeah, my name is Jan Rückmann. Uh, I'm from the University of Bergen, Norway, and uh, I had the pleasure today to give you a lecture on uh, complementarity problems, uh, especially with respect to uh, critical point theory. This is a very important area which became a hot topic uh, in the last two, two decades uh, because there are a lot of applications where this special structure of optimization problems appear. And what we did today, we looked at these problems and asked the question uh, under which conditions uh, the topological structure of the problems is changing. And we found out that this happens if a particular, uh, a particular type of stationary points appear. And uh, we described how this uh, topological structure will be changed. Thank you very much. Seminar uh, in Statistics, Optimization and Applied Mathematics. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jan Ruckman from the uh, Department of Informatics of the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, we know him, I think, 20 years ago. Uh, um, uh, have uh, met in several conferences, uh, have uh, developed uh, uh, common projects, uh, research projects, and um, well, uh, he has uh, more than 70 papers and is an uh, expert in different uh, fields of optimization and variational analysis. And uh, today he is going to talk about uh, mathematical programs with uh, complementarity constraints. So, uh, thank you again, and we are yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Juan. And thank you very much to the department for the kind invitation, for the nice support, and also for the uh, joint uh, project, as you mentioned, uh, which we are continuing. Uh, I was also told that uh, the, the audience here comes from several areas, so I give a little bit of an overview about results in an area which is called mathematical programs with complementarity constraints, and uh, my particular point of view will be on critical point theory. I will define all the things. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So here's the outline. There are no surprises, of course. Uh, I will give a short introduction as well as a program formulation, as well and. Uh, after presenting some notations and auxiliary results, the main uh, results are given as these keywords, morse lemma, deformation and cell attachment theorem. And uh, finally, if we have time, I will go to discussion of different stationary concepts. Uh, so I, uh -huh. Yeah. So what is an mathematical problem with complementarity constraints, which I will further on abbreviate as MPCC. So uh, mainly it is to minimize a function, which is always uh, what we are doing in optimization, subject to a feasible set M. And uh, the feasible set M has a particular structure. Uh, let me make it... Um, this is not clear to me. No, no, but uh, how to get to the next? Uh -huh. Okay. I will, at the end, I will learn how to manage it. Uh, okay. So what we are uh, looking at is the following. We have a function f, which is twice continuously differentiable. If we only uh, look at first order conditions, then it's enough to assume C1. And we have complementarity constraints. These are the blue ones here, the first line of the blue ones. So we have pair of constraints, f1m and f2m, which are uh, supposed to be non-negative. And the corresponding product is always equal to zero. So it means the simplest case in order to have a geometric idea what that means is if we have two uh, variables x1 and x2 which are uh, non-negative and we say the product must be zero then the corresponding set looks like that. Yeah, the boundary of the non-negative orthand that is referring to uh, 
these uh, complementarity constraints and instead of uh, looking at um, variables only we are of course assuming that we are considering functions so f1m and f2m so m is the index which connects both and m is varying in a finite set k and we can also assume uh, constraints of the structure which we know from finite from standard optimization yeah, that we say okay we have uh, finitely many equality constraints and finitely many inequality constraints here the main focus of course will be on these complementarity constraints so on these pairs of um, uh, functions whose product is equal to zero this is a problem under consideration and what we are looking at is uh -huh, uh, the following goals. We will look at uh, these mathematical problems with complementarity constraints from a topological point of view. In the following sense, we are asking, let's say, generally uh, asked, how can we generalize the results from the Morse theory? The so Morse theory is a very old topic from the 60s. And I will make in the next slide a uh, picture in order to get in uh, order to be more familiar with this idea. And the idea is the following. Before I present the picture, let me say something to that. Um, we will study the behavior of topological properties of lower level sets. So lower level sets or feasible lower level sets, also all feasible points, x from m whose corresponding function values are less than or equal um, as a given uh, uh, level. Yeah? As fx is less than or equal to a, and the level of course is varying. And the question is, how does this topological, or how does the uh, topological property, how is the shape of this set, how is it changing when we crossing a level which contains a stationary point? Uh, the first thing what uh, we will do is a so-called constant uh, so-called Mohs lemma for MPCC and Mohs lemma is a normal form. Yeah, we can always, if we for example uh, assume that the functions are linearly independent, we can use a gradient as new variables. That means if we have one, um, if we have one a pair of constraints, then a normal form would look like that. Yeah. So, and if we uh, generalize this to this uh, more sophisticated structure, the question is how we, can we uh, describe here a normal form, which turns out uh, to be a Morse lemma. The second question is, um, as I already said, what happens if, okay, no, deformation theorem, uh, we are looking at two levels, okay, so A and B. And the question is, if we vary, if we go in from A to B, or the other way back, how is the topological uh, uh, structure of these sets are changing? And uh, we will see that if we are going from one level A to another level B, uh, then the set MA can be uh, continuously um, assigned to the set MB, without any change in the topological structure, <coughs> which is called as a strong deformation retract. So I will not go, this is a very technical definition. Let me say it in that way. You have one set and with the homotopy, you transform it to another set without changing the topological structure. Yeah? And that is when we have no, between these two levels, that we have no stationary point. Then that naturally arises the question, what happens if we have a stationary point? Yeah. And we will see that exactly there are different concepts of stationarity for mathematical problems with complementarity constraints. And what we will see is that exactly the so-called C stationary points, which I will define later, um, give rise to a change in the topological structure. Uh, the, the, what I already said is that we have here no change in the topological structure when we go from one level set MA to MB. And uh, that means, for example, that the number of connecting components stay the same. Yeah? The number of holes stay the same. Homotopy, homology, structure, and so on. Okay? Which is, of course, important for global optimization questions. When we are on one connecting com component, normally we will not go to another one, because we don't know how to go there. Yeah. Uh, so the number of connected components is a very important question in the context of global optimization. 
Okay, so this was a case, uh, what I already said, if we are from MB, MA to MB without having a C stationary point. And the question now is then what happens if we have a C stationary point? And then the topological structure is changing. Yeah, we will see how, is, how it will be changed. Um, Here is a formulation. I will explain it then afterwards with more details. Also we have the following situation. We have two levels, A and B. And there is a level in the middle where we have a corresponding feasible point, x bar, such that the uh, corresponding function value is between A and B. And then can, it can be shown that MB is homotopy equivalent to MA together with a Q cell attached. I will explain in a moment what I mean with this. Uh, so that means the Q cell attached refers to the change in the topological structure here. And the question is then, uh, what is the dimension of this cell? The dimension is Q and uh, this Q, which we will define, will be called the C index and it is a generalization of the classical Morse index. Uh, I will show it in the next slide, what I mean with this. Uh, and later on then, if we look at the finite uh, standard optimization to the quadratic or stationary index. This quadratic or stationary index in um, our context here... If you want to tell that the talk, the couple... Ah, perhaps, yeah. That is a good idea. Let's see. Better, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, this Q cell, the dimension Q, here we are, depends on two things. It depends on the restricted Hessian of the Lagrangian, namely on the negative eigenvalues of it, restricted to the tangent space. And it depends on this green thing here, namely on the Lagrange multipliers related to those active constraints where both in one pair are active. Yeah? And this, if we have these three constraints here and we have the product is zero, that means at least one of them is zero. And if both are zero, then we say it is a biactive complementarity constraint. Both are zero. And then uh, the Lagrange multipliers to these so called biactive complementary constraints will play an important role here. Uh, let me. Uh -huh. So I have, an, I have a picture here in order to make that more clear. Morse theory uh, was a first context where this kind of st uh, changes in the topological structure was investigated. And Morse theory is when we only look at one function f. So we have only objective function if you want to see it in the context of optimization. The Morse theory was independently in optimization. We have one uh, function f and we ask the same question. What happens if we look at the level sets of this function and the level is varying? So let us start. If we, have, if we were here at a level uh, which is less than the level of this minimizer, then the corresponding level set is zero. Uh, this is the empty set. Yeah. So then we go up and we come to this first minimizer. That means the level set becomes a point. Yeah. Let's say it like here, that's a point. Yeah. So that means we have here a change of the topological structure from the empty set to non-empty set. If we go further up, then uh, we got this set here as a corresponding level set. Topologically, they are the same. The point and this set. Yeah, that can be with the homotopy uh, continuously deformed in one into the other. Okay? That means the next change will happen if we reach the level with this local minimizer. Okay, so that means here a new component is born, which refers to that here. Okay, and then we go further up, then we have two connected components, but these two connected components are topologically the same as this newborn component and this one. Yeah, so here nothing is happening. And then the next change in the topological structure will happen when we pass here the saddle point. Well, then both will be glued together and then we get a connected set here 
is the corresponding level set. And the question is now, we have three changes, okay? We have three changes. The first two changes appear when a new component is born. That means when we uh, cross a level which contains a local minimizer. And the third change is happening when both components are together here. Okay? And the question is then, how can we describe these changes? We see it here from the illustration. Yeah, but it is obviously not clear how, where is the relationship between properties of F and the change of the topological structure. And the Morse theory states the following. Uh, we define so-called K cells, which are here in red defined. So D0 is a single point. D0 is a single point. DK, D1 is uh, D0 is a single point, so D1, we have the definition here, so that is x from R1, one dimension, and uh, the uh, value of x is less than or equal to 1, so that means we have something like that, between minus 1 and 1, then we have D2, which is uh, something like that, yeah. the disk, and so on. D3 is a sphere, and so on, with uh, radius 1. And then we see that we put here the two components, we connect them with a Q cell D1, yeah, we have two components, and then attach a one cell, which connects both components, and we get the corresponding topological set here. Okay? And the question now is, the, the change of the topological structure is related to the attachment of a cell of dimension K, or Q, which we uh, called it here. And the question is, where comes this dimension from? And the answer is very easy. It depends on the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian of this function. So that means here, if we have a minimizer, then the number of negative eigenvalues is zero. And the corresponding cell we are touching is zero. D0 has a dimension zero. If we have a cell point, then the number of uh, is one. Yeah. Always supposing we are in a non-degenerate case, it means all eigenvalues are non-zero. Yeah. And you can, um, uh, f thinking further on, let's look at the function which is the other way around. So we have a maximum. Yeah. If we have a maximum and we look, as this is now turned around, and we look at this level and then the level which is greater than the maximum, then before, before reaching the top of the mountain, our level set looks like that. Well, we are cutting here out the, the top of the mountain. And then after passing the level of the mountain top, we get something like that. So what we are doing is, we glue in this, D2. Yeah? So in case of a maximum, all, eigen, of all uh, eigenvalues are negative, in two-dimensional case, these are two, and so on. Yeah? So this is done in Morse theory. Morse theory which was independently developed uh, on optimization, um, looked at changes of the topological structure and it was stated that the change can be described by attaching a Q-cell where the dimension Q is exactly equal to the number of negative eigenvalues uh, of the Hessian at this uh, considered critical point. That's a critical point. Yeah, we have a local minimizer and we have here a stationary point, so the gradient, if we only have one function, is equal to zero. This was done then later on um, using by Kojima in the 80s and also Jung and Jung uh, in his book from 2000 for finite optimization problems. Yeah, I will come back to this later on, where they describe that the change in the topological structure now of the feasible uh, uh, lower level set, 
Uh, here we have only one function, no feasible set. Well, the feasible set is a rule space if you want. But if we have a feasible set, then instead of the uh, lower level sets, we are looking at the feasible lower level sets and uh, are investigating the corresponding questions. And we got a similar result. Yeah? The number of um, the change of the topological structure is described by the attachment of a Q cell and the dimension Q is equal to the number of uh, negative eigenvalues. And now, in finite optimization, negative eigenvalues of the Lagrangian restricted to the tangent space. And that gave us a term termini like quadratic index, stationary index. It's all the same. Yeah. And the question now is what we are looking at here now is um, that uh, what, how can we do this here uh, for MPCCs as a programs with complementarity constraints and uh, we will, can see as a, it will of course also depend on the Hessian of the Lagrangian restricted to the tangent space. But another factor comes into play here namely the Lagrange multipliers related to bi-active complementarity constraints. We will see how uh, that can be described. Okay, now, there's the other way around, sorry. Moment. Yes. Global interpretation, okay, so M is compact and connected. Uh, we have a suitable constraint qualification, for example, linear, linear independence constraint qualifications, and we will assume that all C stationary points are non-degenerate. So we will create us in, let's say, a normal form for uh, our problem. Uh, I will define what I mean with non-degenerate and with pairwise different functional value. That's a technical assumption. We can make that by a small perturbation so that we need not to describe for the same level the, change which are the changes which are related to two different stationary points. Uh, and if we look here at these pictures, then we see the boundary of D2, D3 as a corresponding sphere and so on, are connected. But the boundary of D1, consisting of these two points, is not connected. In order, that means only a point with one negative uh, eigenvalue can connect two different components because the boundary is disconnected. Yeah, so we can, if we um, glue D2 here, for example, into this one, then this is because the boundary is connected, it can be glued only to one component not to two connected components. So it means the number of changes in the, the change in the number of connected components can only happen if we have to glow here a one-dimensional cell, if and only if. And that is said what, um, what we say here. Yeah, so that means if we have, um, if we have K local minimizers, then we have at least k minus 1 c stationary points with c index in equal to 1 yeah, when we put all together. These are uh, uh, one possible consequence of this theory. Okay, now we have to uh, say our, uh, our results. Uh, some things will be technical, but I will try to avoid uh, too much technicalities here. Um, so, active inequality index set are all those indices where we have corresponding uh, active inequality constraints. The interesting set is the biactive index set. No, remember our green description here? Uh, biactive means that if we have such a pair of, co of constraints whose product is equal to zero, interesting is if uh, both are zero. If only one is zero, Remember that was a picture here, the green one. If we are here, yeah, that means x1 is 0 and x2 is unequal to 0, then locally that is like a, an equation. x1 is 0 and that's it. Yeah? So that means this is, uh, gives us nothing about structure and for complementarity constraints. The interesting case is when both are 
equal to zero, also interesting in the sense that is more than the standard finite optimization. And um, in that case, uh, we look at the index set, also all m's where the corresponding two functions for which form one pair are equal to zero. And then we uh, define corresponding index sets where exactly one of them is equal to zero. Again, this, the blue set here, will play an important role in the following. Okay. We will also call uh, the linear independence constraint qualification uh, for MPCCs, uh, which only means all active constraints are active. Uh, all active constraints form a set of linearly independent uh, gradients. Yeah, that is uh, we need for differential uh, for the reasons for differential geometry. Now let us define what is called the C-stationary point. As you remember, I, I mentioned in the beginning there are different concepts of stationarity in the context of complementarity constraints. We will see that exactly the C-stationary, <coughs> which C goes back to Clark, uh, play, has this role. Uh, such that exactly a C stationary point implies a change in the topological structure. And you see that here, so we have, um, we have that the gradient of the objective function is a linear combination of these active constraints. Look at the blue things, these are the most important here. So M beta of X bar refers to those where both are active. Yeah, also both appear here in this linear combination and the product is greater than or equal to zero. That means both are non-negative or both are non-positive. It's not possible one is negative and the other is positive. If this is the case and uh, these other condition here as well, of course, then we say that is a C-stationary point. Okay. Uh, if LICQ holds, then they are of course uniquely determined, that is implied by linear independence. And uh, we can also see then that this linear independence implies that locally this set M of X bar, where only the active constraints come into play, are uh, a p-dimensional C2 manifold. That is clear. Okay. Now we have to say when we are talking about a C stationary point, what means non-degeneracy? Yeah, so we exclude cases which gives us, for example, at infinity a problem or something like that. Yeah, so we are considering nice points. I will come back to this uh, later, justifying that it makes sense to consider, uh, to consider only non-degenerate points. So we say that the C stationary point is non-degenerate if the linear independence constraint qualification holds if all the corresponding Lagrange multipliers belonging to the active inequality constraints are positive, as it's not allowed that one of them is zero, that the Hessian restricted to the tangent space is non-singular, so all eigenvalues are non-zero, either positive <coughs> or negative. And uh, remember what we have said here, that the product of those biactive multipliers has to be non-negative, as both has to be non-negative or both have to be non-positive, and we assume now that the product is greater than zero. So it means none of them is zero. Both are positive or both are negative. Yeah, so this is non-degeneracy, so there are different uh, sources for this, where it was used uh, were well, introduced as non, a non-degenerate C stationary point. And, uh, yeah, question? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, Hessian of the Lagrangian, so that is also not, nothing. Okay, Hessian of the Lagrangian, and then we denote the tangent space, which is also defined here in a standard manner. Okay, so perhaps, uh, I said here ND3, let me come back to... So I said here that the restriction of the Lagrangian restricted to the um, tangent space is non-singular, so what does it mean? A matrix restricted to a space is non-singular, I explained it here, it's also a standard way. No? 
so that we say if we look at a matrix whose columns form a basis for this tangent space, also V forms the basis, the columns of V form a basis of the tangent space, then non-degeneracy, the third uh, property means that this matrix here is non-singular. Uh, that does not depend on the uh, choice of this matrix V. Okay? And uh, now, C index refers now to this dimension of the Q cell. Now remember that in the Morse theory, in the classical Morse theory, on the classic finite optimization, that was equal to the number of negative eigenvalues of the restricted Hessian. Now comes another thing into play. We define it. Let X bar from M be a non-degenerate C stationary point, and we call then as usual, the number of negative eigenvalues of the restricted Lagrangian, restricted to the tangent space, is called the quadratic index, as in the literature. Okay, but now we look at the pairs of Lagrange multipliers for those where both of these corresponding functions are equal to zero. And remember the corresponding uh, sigma bar 1 and sigma bar 2, the product has to be positive, both are negative, both are positive, or both are positive, and uh, we count those pairs where the corresponding uh, multipliers are negative. Uh, so we look, these two are positive, these two are negative, positive, negative, and so on, and then we, we uh, count the, those which are negative, and then we call this the so-called biactive index of um, x bar. And then, yeah, we got the dimension of the uh, cell here. The sum of both QI and BI is called the C index. Uh, the C index because of C stationarity. Uh, this is not correct here 2006. It was only given in 2010 or 11. But the working paper was made in 2006. So they introduced first this index. Also again, this is what here's a difference to the standard optimization. Uh, we are not looking only at the quadratic index. We are not looking at the number of uh, negative eigenvalues of the restricted Hessian, as we did in the literature for standard optimization problems. Here now comes into play the number of those pairs whose corresponding Lagrange multipliers are negative, and the sum of both will give us the C index. And that means this C index is then plays a role of this dimension of the cell we are gluing in order to characterize the change of the topological structure. And that means only the sum QI plus BI imports here. So it doesn't matter if it is 2 plus 5 or 5 plus 2. Yeah. So it means these are very different properties, obviously. A number of negative eigenvalues of a Hessian and the number of Lagrange multipliers or of pairs of Lagrange multipliers which are negative. I'll come to back to this uh, in a moment. Okay. Uh, okay, so I, I, I gave you already this as a commentary uh, previously. Also if we don't look at complementarity constraints, uh, only at the standard optimization, we have only the part with the negative eigenvalues, which is a quadratic index part, and then you can uh, go back in the literature. Milner was the first one with the Morse theory in 63, uh, who used this index, quadratic index, number of negative eigenvalues. Kojima used it as and called it the stationary index when he characterized strongly stable stationary points. And also Young and Younger Twilt in the book from 86 and newly uh, uh, published in 2000 uh, used this and called it quadratic index. Okay. Uh, C stationary point, why is it concept introduced? Uh, this is obviously one uh, property which is important in optimization. And um, this is a quadratic index as well as a stationary index characterize in a unique way which kind of stationary point or C stationary point uh, we have. Now, a stationary index, for example, means 
Local minimizer if and only if the index is zero. Local maximizer if and only if the index is n. And all the things between, also all indices uh, between zero and n, refer to saddle points. And here we can make the same. Yeah, we can say, okay, if we have a local minimizer, then this is if and only if the c index is equal to zero. That means c index, remember, it was bi plus ci, both have to be uh, equal to zero. Okay, I lost, I'm a little bit lost. How much time I do I have? Around 50 minutes. Okay, yeah. good. Um, before I come to the statement, let me uh, give a justification why it makes sense to restrict ourselves to those problems where the linear independence constraint qualification is used and also where we assume that all C stationary points under consideration are non-degenerate. Both refer to a set which is open and dense. C2S means here the strong or Whitney topology. So that means we have generic properties. Yeah? So assuming linear independence uh, and or uh, the non-degeneracy of the points under consideration is a generic property, so it will not exclude too much uh, problems here. Okay, now let us come to the statement of the results. Okay, the first thing is um, we would like to state a Morse lemma, so we want to like to state a normal form, and we say that our feasible set admits a so-called local C2 coordinate system of Rn at the point under consideration x bar using a corresponding diffeomorphism as a coordinate transformation so that our point under consideration is equal to zero. Uh, we only shift makes a coordinate system that the point under consideration is a zero point. And then um, we get locally that our set M intersected by a local neighborhood is equal to this set. So what is it here? So this refers to the equality constraints H of J0 X bar. H is a non-negative orthant. It refers to the active uh, inequality constraints. And then we have that DH2. Well, perhaps I take that away and make the picture again here. So H2 is a non-negative orthant, which is here, and the boundary is then exactly that. Yeah, so this is dh2. And, uh, of course, uh, we have so much dh2s as we have uh, active pairs of constraints. So that means the cardinality of the set beta of x bar. And this is a dimension on what the problem really depends, p. Yeah. And we have here the corresponding neighborhood. So that means uh, we can use, by, because of the linear independence constraint quantification, we can use the so-called standard diffeomorphism, which means uh, we can use the gradients as a new coordinates. Okay? And then we got this Morse lemma here. We have it here. No? Here we have it. Also again, we have a non-degenerate C stationary point. Um, with the C index QI plus BI, then we can make such a coordinate transformation. Yeah, the phi refers to the coordinate transformation. These are the new coordinates, and we get then this blue description here. So that means we are choosing the gradients of the uh, active constraints as a new coordinates. And then we see, here's plus minus and plus minus, so that means, uh, we see it here, the letter equation contains exactly bi, the b active index, negative linear pairs, here, also we have minus, which refers to one pair where the corresponding uh, Lagrange multipliers are negative, and plus where the corresponding Lagrange multipliers are positive, and here we have also the corresponding um, number of positive squares, which refers to the number of positive eigenvalues, and negative squares, which refers to qi, to the quadratic index. Yeah, so these pairs, bi plus qi, define the corresponding c index, define the cell, the dimension of the cell, to be attached in order to describe the topological uh, change. 
Uh, let me make a short comment here. The problem, or in many occasions we have the problem at this point. It is clear because it's not, maybe we lose the differentiability at this point. And uh, what we can do is, of course, we can use, uh, take the green thing, take an iron and make it smooth. Yeah, so we make from this um, boundary of the two-dimensional orthant, we make one dimension. We are losing, of course, the differentiability, but we keep the Lipschitz, score, Lipschitz uh, property. Yeah, so we can do this. Um, then uh, we come to other results, not to other results, but results which are related to Lipschitz uh, properties. And uh, I gave this here uh, uh, as a short comment here. So as a, again, uh, as a extension of phi on this uh, boundaries of these green boundaries here, and then we get such a corresponding uh, coordinate transformation. Okay, uh, this here. Okay, so this is a corollary where we make the corresponding uh, Lipschitz coordinates. But let us come back to the to that what we really want. No, halt. Here, the main theorem is that. So we state now the theorem, which, all, which I tried to modify in the beginning. Now we have the tools for that. Yeah? We have defined what is a new index. Uh, that means we can say what happens when a change in the topological structure appears. And we make the following, uh, we make the following assumptions here. As we look at this intermediate level set between the levels A and B, we assume that it's compact in order to avoid any problems at the infinity, this is some kind of Pallismel condition, and suppose that the uh, linear dependence constraint qualification is satisfied at all of these intermediate points, as all of these points between the levels A and B, and then we get a, a, a generalization of this deformation theorem, which says if this intermediate level set, as between the levels MA and MB, there is no C stationary point, then both sets are topologically equivalent. Yeah? Or in other words, it is uh, that one level set is a so-called strong deformation retract of the other one. Yeah? This is a technical description of this uh, homotopy, which uh, assigns one set to the other one. And as that is the case, again, if we have MA, MB, no C stationary point in between. If we have a stationary point, then the SELT attachment theorem states or describes the situation if it contains exactly one C stationary point, say X bar, between these two levels, and the C index is equal to Q, then MB is homotopy equivalent to MA with the Q cell attached. So that is the same, geometrically, in illustration, the same picture as we had seen in the beginning. Yeah? We glue a corresponding Q cell in order to describe this topological change. Here uh, I made another small illustration in order to make it a little bit more clear. So let us consider the situation, what we had here. Yeah? We have the simplest case, we have one pair of constraints, we have x1 is greater than 0, x2 is greater than 0, and uh, that must be equal to 0 here, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, of course we have only that. And let us assume that uh, the gradient of f, the level, level, level lines of f, are these. So that means uh, the level of f is increasing in this direction. Yeah. And then we see if we have this level line here, then the, the level line for F, then we have the corresponding lower level set. Uh, these are these two green parts here. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we go further on, passing this point here, then the lower level set is that. So something is happening here. We are connecting two, uh, two components. And the only way to do this, as we have seen, is by attaching a D1 cell. Yeah? Attach, this is the first green part, this is the other green part. We put them together and got this. 
And we, we, we are asking now the question, how can we describe this point here? We see we are in the two-dimensional case, we have two variables, and then we see, and we are also in a two-dimensional space here, so that means two active constraints in the two-dimensional space means a restricted Lagrangian is zero, or yeah, there are no, uh, no eigenvalues, and especially no negative eigenvalues, so the quadratic index is zero. And then we see, of course, that both are active here at this point, yeah, and both are negative. That means we have one pair of two negative Lagrange multipliers, so that means the biactive index is one. And the sum of both, the sum of both refers to the dimension of the cell. And again, it doesn't matter if you're 0 and 1 or 1 and 0. Yeah, in another situation, the sum is important. Only the sum defines the dimension of the cell which we have to attach here. Okay. Um, let me finish. Uh, perhaps I, I, will, I will skip this. I will come to an example. This is better. Uh, there's a short discussion of different stationary points. The main thing is here, uh, because this is very technical, Aha. So, uh, so it's very technical to see that there's W stationarity, A stationarity, M stationarity, S stationarity, B stationarity, and one can define and one can discuss which is better, which is uh, uh, not so good, and so on. The main point of our talk here is uh, that topological changes happens exactly at C stationary points, not at the other ones which are not C stationary. Yeah? There are points which are more restrictive, yeah? for example, M stationary, Morohovich stationarity. Yeah? So they're more restrictive in, this, in the sense that more points are excluded which are not local minimizers, which is fine for the objective uh, and optimization to find only local minimizers, but you exclude points where topological change may happen. Or you uh, are taking more points into account, yeah? And these are then points, as more points which are not C stationary. That means you take such points into account where no topological structure is changing. Okay? So, uh, okay, so I did it. <laughs> uh, that is what, just what I said here. Yeah. Uh, let me come back to, the, let me come to this example here. Because this is an interesting example. We have a very simple example. Again, we have two constraints. The product is equal to zero. We have again this picture here. And the trick, or one of the possible tricks to solve such problems is to substitute the right hand side here by a positive epsilon. Uh, so then you get, instead of the green set, something like that. Yeah, epsilon goes to zero, then this red set converges to the green set. The point is now the following. Uh, so, and, yeah, and this is of course, let's say, a standard optimization problem. We have an equality constraint and we have two inequality constraints. Okay. Now, we are looking now... Uh, so, here. It is written here. We have three C stationary points. Yeah, so we have, uh, let's start with the green ones. One is here, one zero, the other is here, one zero, and the third one is here. Yeah, so you, you find it here. One zero, zero one, but both are global minimizers. They are here. Yeah, you see that here, these are, is our, uh, something like that, no? These are the level sets, yeah? So we have two minimizers, they are here, and we have one point with C index equal to one. And remember, the C index was a sum of two things, the quadratic index and the biactive index. And now we look at this perturbed problem, and what we get, and that's uh, interesting for me, what we get is, we get exactly three points Remember the 
the uh, red curve refers to uh, uh, to standard optimization problems. We have a standard optimization. We get three stationary points, which are converging if epsilon goes to zero to these three green points, and they have the same index. Also, the index in the standard optimization is only the quadratic index, is only the number of negative eigenvalues. Yeah, so we have here some kind of stability between the number of stationary points under non-degeneracy and so on, and also the index remains the same. That's important because the index characterizes the type of stationary point, if it's a local minimizer, a settle point, or a local maximizer. And uh, this is interesting to, to to ask the question under which conditions uh, this topological structure is maintained or through we are disturbing the original problem if we go back here if we are disturbing here the original problem in such a way that it becomes a standard optimization problem and uh, with this uh, I would like to finish uh, I would also say these uh, are results which we uh, uh, put together in several papers together with Bert Jung and Vladimir Schickmann but what I said in the beginning uh, I would like to give you some overview lecture on this complementarity constraints problem thank you very much is there a question remark just a question. Yes. You call C a stationary point. C comes from Clark. As far as I know, yeah. Uh, as far as you know. Yes. Uh, because the concept was given, introduced by him, or, or because you apply some chain of theory? No, Clark, uh, that I, I, I don't. I don't. Concept, you, know? you mean in memory, not in memory, but in uh, reputation to him? I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that the M stationarity is goes to, to Boris. Tomorovich, <laughs> as that he introduced, but but it, it can be that it goes back to to Clark. But I, everybody is saying that I never checked it. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I thought I yeah, well. that it is more or less answered uh, at the end of your talk. It's about the stability of the, yeah. uh, this kind of uh, problem, the stability of this concept with to perturbations mm -hmm. on the right hand side or something like that. But in, in this case, I see uh, an example in which you perturb the, uh, uh, I don't know, it's a, a generic, uh, general question about the uh, stability of such a, perhaps in, in the linear case, for starting in the uh, simpler, simplest case. Uh, okay. You know, general, yeah. is, is it a, a field uh, very studied? Uh, we never looked further in, into that about uh, if this topological structure is maintained in general or under which conditions. What I don't think is that it works in the linear case because um, you are looking at Hessians. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. I think um, that one can prove uh, that these indices are the same. As one can really prove that not only illustrated by an example uh, under certain conditions, but uh, as far as I know, it, it, that's an open question. Uh, the point is also that um, we never looked, I mean, this is related to, let's say, solution methods. Yeah. And we never looked at solution methods. We, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it is uh, interesting to to know how to, to detect the, the, the bad guys, uh, the bad points, from the, the point of view of uh, perturbations. Uh, uh, these points, when, well, if this set is a solution of some model, uh, in which uh, points you can break the, the, uh, the, the solution to set? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, because in, in two dimensions you see, but in, in, in general it's good to, to, to see what's uh, behind in order to, to detect which are his points. Yeah, the, the, and, and what the, that is what we showed. No? So we, we said changes are 
possible if and only if mm -hmm. you have a C-stationary point. No other point is causing such things, also yes. there are other points which can be local minimizers, everything, but... Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, other bands cannot be local minimizers, that's what we said. It's clear, if you have a local minimizer, a new component is always born. Yeah, if you go the level up and you have a local minimizer, then of course there's a change. There must be a change, there must be a C-stationary point. Yes. But this is what uh, one statement we made. Ne? If we have a C local minimizer, then under our conditions of non-degeneracy, then it is a C-stationary point. Yeah. But all the other points, there only the C stationary points play a role. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there any other question or remark? In that case, uh, thanks to the speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs>